Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to episode 69, that's right, 69 of the Cloudcast. We are, as always, coming to you live from our massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina, and tonight we are going to do kind of a follow-up on what was probably one of our most popular podcasts of the year. Uh, so we brought back two of the three, well, actually three of the four of us will be back from the Fantasy Cloud podcast. Uh, Aaron Delp, how are you doing tonight, man? I'm doing great, man. Thanks. And uh, our friend from the West Coast, Colin McNamara. How are you, Colin? I'm doing awesome. How are you guys doing? Good, good, good. So uh, our last partner in crime, Nick Weaver, was unfortunately unable to, to make it tonight. He's actually still working hard for the year. Um, so we're going to miss Nick. Uh, but what we thought we'd do is we're going to go through a couple of things. Um, so it's it's interesting. When we, when we did this show, uh, I don't know, about three months ago maybe, um, we thought it was going to be a complete joke. We were just kind of... Joking around. We even debated we, whether or not we were going to publish it. We we were like, we're going to hit record and we'll see how it goes, and then maybe we'll publish it. <laughs> yeah, because it was one of those like sort of it was one of those sort of stupid ideas we had like at some trade show, and we thought, oh, well, we'll try it. And Nick and Colin were available, and um, it ended up, I think, being maybe the second most popular show we had. Um, and I think part of it was just because some of the vendors and stuff were interested in in their own stuff. But uh, so it, it was interesting to us. We were joking around after the show that none of us picked. Uh, any of the companies that we were associated with. <laughs> so, <laughs> that should give everybody a, a yes. vote of confidence. Um, so what we thought we'd do is we thought we'd uh, we'd do a quick review of uh, how that went. And then um, we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, and uh, it, it's something I've kind of wanted to do. I don't know if the rest of the guys want to do it, but that's fine. Um, that's what we're going to do. Uh, I've got an idea, and I've been kicking it around for a while in my head. I've told a few people, um, and I don't know how I would go about doing it. So I'm going to kind of rally some community support around this idea and see if anybody likes it and uh, see where it goes. So anyways, you, you're let's... officially open sourcing your idea today. Yeah, I'm open sourcing. Well, because you guys are, are both now dirty software, free software pirate hackers. So I figure that's the, that's the, the new sort of mantra of the show. We'll just give everything away. We give the show away for free. So we'll just give our ideas away too. So, all right. Um, so why don't we do this, uh, Colin? Why don't you go first, since you went first in the in the fantasy draft, and give us your uh, your take on your your draft now, looking at it uh, uh, three months into the into the thing. So um, <clears throat> three months into it, uh, I'd say I am only uh, not totally stupid, um, only partially. So uh, let me see. Service now continued strength. Nothing big and shiny with them. I really thought in Stras we would get bought. I, I really would. Um, I, I just saw, actually, um, uh, this morning I was looking at, uh, I'm blanking on the name, uh, Cloud Sherpa has got $40 million as a cloud brokerage. Um, I, I still think no one on earth actually gets what Instress does. Um, let me see, Mirantis, I'd say a good call. Um, they have hired an immense number of people since then. Um, since we talked uh, three months ago, I, let me see, they did Cisco WebEx's OpenStack. Uh, they've been writing drivers for EMC. Uh, they did uh, the, the OpenStack at the Gap. Um, they've been really uh, kind of uh, really growing very strong. So that's that's a really great call. Chef, obviously, um, uh, you know, systems automation, uh, backends for DevOps, both Chef and Puppy. You can't go wrong there. Uh, Cynics, I would say that was a complete failure. <laughs> o- open Compute, while um, I say emerging, is still not taken off in the past three months. Accenta. Um, I don't know if you guys have been seeing it, but there's some white papers published uh, for their Cisco VDI appliance. Say so growing very strong with their um, uh, integrations to OpenStack. Joint, I think, has proved that uh, you shouldn't build clouds on Open Solaris, so I was wrong there. Um, <coughs> absolutely. Nice. <laughs> absolutely shouldn't. And, yeah, no, no offense to Brennan and Dtrace, but Dtrace is not a reason to build a cloud platform. Um, let me see. Uh, Casa, you know, uh, actually, I think Casa got acquired. Um, or at least the teams did. So, oh, they did? Uh, I didn't see that. Uh, it's the back ends. It's the back end of LifeLock, actually, oh, now. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and then uh, NTT um, has actually been, obviously, they're not going to get acquired, but uh, they've actually had some significant cloud wins. Interesting how they're they're pitting, uh, was it Treb, uh, I'm forgetting Treb's last name, Opsource um, acquisition, their kind of enterprise cloudy stuff against the uh, NTT ISIL. Um, OpenStack Cloud. So they're actually competing against themselves and growing very strong. 
Um, so I'd, I'd say uh, a few complete misses on there. Um, okay, so you, but uh, I'd say the like top a... ones to benefit out of there are uh, Mirantis, Chef, uh, uh, Nixenta, and then uh, AT&T. I'd say the first uh, wireline service provider who to start to get a clue around uh, cloud platforms. Okay. I, I think you're right. I, I still think uh, – I think you're right. I think folks don't really know – who in Stratus is or what they do, uh, at least not clearly. Um, but I think they're still probably on a lot of people's radar in terms of potentially an acquisition. And I, like, I wouldn't be surprised if Mirantis gets picked up uh, by like somebody like Cisco or something who, who says, look, if we're, if we're now in, in building our own sort of variation on, uh, on OpenStack or, you know, building their own um, distribution of it, um, I think some of those guys, whether it's a Mirantis or, or uh, was it CloudStack? Not CloudStack, uh, um, Randy Bias's company. The guys who know how to do OpenStack, I suspect they'll get picked up here in uh, 2013 as folks look to build their engineering organizations. Well, I think even more than that, that <clears throat> uh, the value of a board seat has shot up exponentially as, as, uh, as the uh, foundation has really gone through the governance challenges um, you know the, the board seat members. They they have twenty or what, sixteen guaranteed seats. Yeah, and, you've got a very good point there. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, you know the OpenStack is, I believe, becoming the ITF for cloud. You might say, and for the three major vendors, Dell, HP, and Cisco, um, that are the major contributors, and you know, uh, or not major contributors, but the major hardware players in the in the foundation right now. Um, having control of the direction of OpenStack is going to become increasingly important and valuable. All right. Um, what should we do with Nick? Should we should we just kind of quickly go through Nick's? Uh, or yeah, you, just you, you think it? we would have planned this out ahead of time, but yeah. <laughs> well, it's like it's like the way we did the show before. No well, planning whatsoever. Why don't you go through it, Brian? Um, okay. Um, so Cloudability uh, went into GA, so good for those guys. Uh, Matt and, uh, and crew went from uh, beta into GA. Um, the other thing I've noticed about the Cloudability guys, and I, I use their service for some of the Glacier stuff I do, um, I may have broken their algorithms, or I'm going to get a ridiculously large Glacier bill because of the, the emails they send me every couple of days. Um, so I'll, I'll get into that later on about how uh, Glacier works in terms of uh, billing and stuff. But uh, they're doing well. Uh, so we, we looked at uh, Cloudability. Cloudability is going good. Uh, went from beta to GA. Uh, AppFog as a PaaS has announced they're going from uh, a public-only offering to including a private offering. So they're, they're expanding. Um, Parse, I have no idea. Uh, Cloud Passage, um, I think you know, from talking to Rand, I think they continue to keep adding functionality and, and are doing reasonably well, although... Quite honestly, I don't know how the SaaS guys necessarily measure themselves. So, um, you know, and until they go public, it's sort of hard to know unless they're just, I guess, maybe measuring by customers. Uh, AppDirect, I have no idea. Uh, Ink Tank, um, Ed Sai said they're doing well. They hired Ed, although uh, I saw Gina left the company. Oh, that was really fast. So um, Ed says they're doing well. Uh, they've made some announcements recently. I know they signed up uh, to do some stuff with Dell, so that was cool. Um, oh, they, so, so Gina left since, like, the last podcast? Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> so we're, I had no idea. Yeah, we're like the kiss of death. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen some uh, of those so shift, shift around, too. The, uh, a lot of the DDN guys are going over there now. Oh, okay. from, from Data Direct are starting to show up there. I think Tank. Cool. Yeah. Okay. We got to make sure we're not the curse, man. You don't want to be like, oh no, you get on the podcast and That's right. you're off. Yeah. Colin, ho- <laughs> Colin hopefully you get a job next year. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and so. then Greenplum and Bosch are now going to be part of the Pivotal initiative, or right? P- Pivotal, what, uh, whatever the PI thing is that Paul Moritz is going to run for VMware and EMC. So, um, so I think you know Nick did okay. Um, no, uh, we don't know about Parse and AppDirect, but no complete failures, I guess. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and so I'll just uh, throw this out to you guys. What, what do you guys think about the whole pivotal thing? I think it's freaking brilliant. I mean, I think it was the right thing to do. I really do. I think it's the right thing to do. I think it'll be interesting to see how they s- how they're going to go to market, though. I think that's the that's the real question for them. Well, yeah. if you, here's the thing, though. I mean, if if you look at what they have, so you got Cloud Foundry, which is a pass layer. Uh, and it's funny. I, 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 I am speaking as in January down south uh, for, for Citrix. And um, it's about uh, bridging clouds together, right? And so part of the demo is putting up a, a pass layer, putting a Citrix cloud bridge out front, and then 
the challenge I was facing is how do I normalize the database layer? Well, with, with Jim Fire and some of the other stuff that's coming out in conjunction with, with Cloud Foundry, you could basically put a, a Uber pass that uh, abstracts the uh, the data layers from the application and makes it so basically have an eventually consistent multi-cloud database layer. Um, once you have that, you not only have a, a, a tool for ensuring your cloud mobility of your applications, but uh, with the with, with the Greenplum and uh, Project R stuff inside of there, you have just like when when EMC bought VMware, they created a consumption engine for their hardware. Right. Right. Yeah. So now you have a second consumption engine. Yep. Yeah. So do you think? So the the one thing I I would uh, I'm trying to figure out. I mean, besides the if you're a uh, Cloud Foundry you know PaaS service provider today, you know what what's your thinking? We'll have to get one of those guys on. Although I'm sure they won't tell us uh, at this point. <laughs> um, is is the is the Gemfire stuff the right sort of back end database model for this? Because everything I always see those guys talking about is all sort of NoSQL, it's it's Cassandra, it's, uh, you know, it's Reoc, it's Mongo. Um, you know, I've never heard James Waters talk about the Gemfire stuff in conjunction with it. Um, have you got any you sense harvest, of... You harvest the code, though. So if you have some sort of database shim, you hook it into whatever is the appropriate, or maybe you just go and build something or hook into something cool. Yeah. yeah. yeah right, right. <clears throat> All right. Well, cool. Yeah, that'll be an interesting one to see what happens. I, I doubt they're going to announce a whole lot between now and probably uh, end of first quarter. If anything, they probably need to get their act together. That's a lot of people to bring together at one time for like fourteen hundred people or something. All right, Aaron, you want to give yourself a, uh, a grade? Yeah. So, so I think I'm kind of like everyone else in the fact that uh, it didn't suck too bad. Um, <laughs> So, so my first one was Apprenda. Um, they announced their their kind of hybrid cloud solution uh, here recently, and really got a lot of good press around it. I hadn't had a chance to really dig into it too too in depth. I don't know if either of you have. Um, and then next one was Apigee. Apigee's still chugging along like they always are. Um, and then OpenShift. OpenShift. I don't know. I honestly, in hindsight, I probably just should have taken Cloud Foundry instead of OpenShift um, or some other platform, but. At the end of the day, I, I just I don't really hear much about them. I really don't. They just seem to have zero buzz around them. Yeah, um, they they just bought a company today. Red Hat just announced good numbers today, and they just announced they bought Manage IQ. So they, uh, you know, so they yeah. bought another. You know, they they keep buying pieces of the stack, um, but you know, you just don't hear tons and tons of people sort of raving about it. And I don't know if it's just because you know they're still working to put it together or what that all means. Yep. Um, next one I had was Bromium. That was my, uh, you know, my seed money choice from from way back. Uh, cloud scaling again. I, I'm surprised. I, I will be very surprised if they don't get bought in some way, shape, or form um, in the next year. They're kind of like Marantis for me. Um, Crowbar. Crowbar is just still still Crowbar. It's chugging along, doing its thing. Um, and the same with Puppet, which is my ne- my next pick. And then last one was our path. Our path was was acquired by by SaaS, and that we, we Brian and I talked about it. You know, Raleigh company buying a Raleigh company. Um, that was very interesting to us, um, and it really makes me kind of wonder what what SaaS is is going to be doing with our path long term. Yeah, I don't, I don't. It, it was a, sort of an interesting one. I ran into the guys at one of the DevOps meetings, and I was like, "Hey, I heard you got bought by SaaS," and he was like, had that look on his face, like it's not public yet. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, I think it's like, well, you should have checked Twitter then. <laughs> you know, there was there was a thing that was kind of in the local papers about SaaS that they were, you know, they were building out their own data center. They were planning to, you know, build some uh, on-demand services that they didn't necessarily do today. And this was, I don't know, seven eight months ago. So this may be part of their, you know, plan to go, you know, into into on-demand services, just like you know everybody else is doing SAP and Oracle and, and everybody they compete against. So. Um, you know, it was a small team. I think they bought about 15 guys or something like that. It's a, not a huge engineering team. So, yeah, and you, you, you never know with so so. Goodnight is the the founder and you know owner of SaaS and all of that. And you just you never know what he's going to do on that property because I mean, you've got the the SaaS campus, then you have the Umstead, which is the the huge restaurant bed and breakfast and all this other. Stuff. He's got very crazy tastes, and he just kind of builds and buys everything. And he owns so much land here in Raleigh and Cary. He just does whatever he wants. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's up on his hill with his giant mansion looking down. Yeah, he literally does. That's absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> so. All right. 
Uh, so what do you what do you say? You give yourself a kind of a middle grade, or yeah, a, I would say middle grade because tools. I definitely I, I whiffed on a couple, and and a couple of them, you know, either announced some new things or got purchased. So yeah, I'd, you know, I think the, the fair crowbar, grade. The crowbar stuff got a little bit of news this last week or so once uh, Dell finally announced sort of formal. Uh, uh, formal OpenStack, the sort of their own version of OpenStack, and I think Crowbar's part of that. And uh, yeah. so, Ro- so Rob's, you know, Rob's campaigning for a uh, for a board seat, and uh, mm-hmm. so it's it's still, you know, it's it's important for Dell, obviously. Well, I was talking to Rob uh, two days ago, I think, and so yeah, they, they've been doing a lot with Crowbar. Um, they're doing obviously kind of trying to do firmware system personality stuff as well as automating the. Uh, the configurations, installation, and integration of things like OpenStack. Um, they integrated uh, their Ecologic uh, arrays into Elastic Block Services or Cinder uh, with it. I believe Ceph too, if memory serves me right. Um, oh, cool. The, the most interesting thing that, uh, that he was saying was that uh, they're taking it, you know, we're looking, we have continuous integration with Jenkins, right? The ability to continuously roll and smoke test code and then six month, re- six month releases. And uh, what was really interesting to me is uh, I was actually doing something with Ceph, or excuse me, with Crowbar that I've been trying to do with SFB OpenStack, is that uh, take uh, daily or weekly builds and create packages and automatic, basically do continuous deployment of OpenStack using it, which is, uh, I say, going to become the new norm probably over the next 12 months. So they're doing, they're doing uh, I'd say uh, Rob is a, a brilliant man, and his, uh, and his teams over at Crowbar are doing things, uh, doing very innovative things. Rob had a really interesting blog uh, this week that, like, there probably was a ton more behind it, but he sort of was, in essence, what he said was, um, you know, OpenStack, at least from his perspective, was kind of reaching one of those points where it was like, Essex is very stable, uh, but uh, all the cool stuff, at least what he felt like the kind of the really next tipping point cool stuff was coming in Grizzly. And it he, is. Was like, he was like, I don't really want to be living on, on Folsom right now, and I can't figure out which side of the fence to get on, and I wish we... Yeah, yeah. In essence, I think what his thing was is uh, like Grizzly is the release that they think has a whole bunch of features, but it doesn't really concentrate on some of the stability stuff that the operations guys need, which is like, how do we do rolling upgrades? Like you said, how do we, yep. you know, deal with mm-hmm. monitoring yep. and management and policy? And so it'll be interesting the next, the spring and, and next fall releases oh. of OpenStack to see, you know, which, which side of the camp is going to push harder. Uh, is it going to be, you know, more functionality? Is it going to be more operational stuff? I say both. I mean, I can. I've, I've been in some pretty heated discussions. Like uh, we're, we're designing out uh, DHCP, DHCP for IPv6, and um, it, it, what's happening is there's a lot more ops guys participating now. Where it used to be the devs, yeah, devs would just dominate, and um, and, and it's, it's actually it's starting to get balanced out. But um, I, and I think where Rob's coming from too is that um, having to support both Quantum and Nova Network um, is is challenging at best. Yeah, and and that living in the middle ground of Folsom right now is um, it, it, it's hard to, especially in the network abstraction layer, um, especially at, at a point where we're looking to insert so many services, it's just really hard to code for both and to support both. So, yeah, Grizzly should sense. be a lot better. All right, all right, I'll go last. Um, so, uh, so I had Write Scale, which uh, I think those guys are doing relatively well, although. You know, sort of like in Stratus, um, everybody speaks very highly of them, but I haven't heard a whole lot of news from them lately. Um, I, I think again, they're they're probably a, a prime target to get picked up by somebody. Um, CloudStack, obviously, in hiring Aaron, they probably sealed their fate. Uh, <laughs> doom, doom yeah, for we'll, failure. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how how far the cat the curse of the podcast goes. With I mean, I, you know, I have I have utmost faith in Peter, but you know, uh, <laughs> uh, the Azure guys obviously moved from uh, from sort of PaaS centric to uh, to to IAS centric and and started getting in the. Uh, the how low can my storage go uh, game? Uh, they got in the middle of that uh, battle with uh, Microsoft and Google, or not Microsoft, uh, AWS and Google, to see how quickly they can get to zero for for storage cost. And I, does, does Azure just feel like a race to the bottom? It does for me. I don't know. The the one thing about Azure, and I, I asked, uh, I did a I did a podcast with somebody else the other day. I can't remember who it was, but um, I, I'm, the thing I'm kind of curious about is now that we've got like. Uh, like a Microsoft cloud, an Oracle cloud, an SAP cloud, or at least the, you know, the, the start of those things is I'm starting to wonder, especially, uh, you know, with, 
all these people looking at like how difficult it is to move big chunks of data. Do we see these guys just say, look, instead of instead of screwing around with like what's the cost of storage, they just say, look, it, the, the storage is free, right? Whatever it will take to get your data and your applications to my cloud, um, I will make it so enticing, at least for my applications. Maybe not all your applications, but but you know the ones with my brand on them. Um, you know, do we see that as the race to zero as opposed to just sort of commodity storage race to zero between, you know, Google and Amazon? And uh, I see the inverse. Um, you know, if you see, I think, I think that we'll see compute as a race to zero, um, probably pay for just power for compute as some sort of, uh, and, and then we'll pay for the things around it. Like I've seen some, and I, I guess I won't say the numbers on this podcast, but I, I would say that in in some of the cloud cloud providers' financials uh, estimations I've seen, that storage is the uh, the main area that they're that you're making money off of, as well as establishing data gravity and yep. uh, um, allowing for some of those higher end services that are kind of layered on top of the compute. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and tend to tend to lock people in. Yeah. It might be right. I mean, you might be right. I mean, there's 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 going to be some lever that I think goes to zero very quickly, and everything else kind of has to get pulled around it but yeah you're right it's somehow you're going to have to get people's data and, and get them to believe you have it um, i mean like amazon redshift establishing yeah, a low-cost yeah, data pipeline exactly, analytics exactly 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 yeah. um salesforce not too much um yeah, i mean they had their big show a bunch of announcements i think they're going to they're going to be going head to head with oracle there oracle just bought what eloqua so they're, they're trying to get into this sort of marketing clouds uh cloudera went through what round E, I think it just took on like another thirty million dollars. So um, I don't know exactly what that means from a VC perspective. I don't think it's a great thing that companies get to round E and nobody's bought them or they've gone IPO. But uh, um, you know they still have the, the majority of the smart Hadoop guys. Uh, Big Switch Networks announced a product finally, um, and they they now seem to be locked in this new battle with uh, with Nicira over whether or not. Um, Open flow and software-defined networking should involve hardware or not involve hardware. They seem to be in the camp of it should involve hardware. Uh, Nicira seems to be in the camp of screw hardware, screw everybody <laughs> who does hardware. Um, let's see, Basho's Basho. Um, they they continue to to keep doing cool stuff with distributed uh, stuff, but I get the sense there people are still trying to figure out what they're doing. Um, I know. Adron Hall, who's been a guest on the show, went over to Basho, so we'll maybe have to get him back on the show to come talk to us. And then Cloud Foundry, obviously, is going to be part of uh, the PI initiative. So um, I give myself an okay grade. Um, you know, there are more mainline names in there than than maybe some other folks, so it's okay. So what do you think about you know um, that you have Cloud Era up on there? What about Hortonworks and kind of entering in that space and with their uh, oh crap? I'm blanking on their name. Their, their, their open source participation. The same thing of Scalar in the in the context of uh, right scale, having a, a very heavy open source uh, option. Yeah, I, you know, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. Like, I get the concepts around the big data stuff, but I, like, I almost feel like the the big data problem. I don't know that it's so much like who's differentiated. I just feel like there's like there's so few people that know what they're doing in this space um, that like nobody's really really kind of pulled themselves ahead. Um, I mean, I think the Horton guys, obviously, because they've got a ton of experience from Yahoo and the Cloudera guys, because they've got the same sort of experience. But I don't think they have massive, I don't think they have enough numbers that if somebody were to acquire them, if a IBM acquired them or a Oracle acquired them or HP acquired them, that you'd be like, oh my God, they're the, the Hadoop guys. Because it's still about building applications then on top of that. And that's a small, small crowd. Right, I mean that's yeah. probably a, that's probably as small a crowd as the guys who know how to deal with OpenStack. <laughs> yeah. Right, I a mean, little bit more esoteric, probably. Realistically, I, I don't know. Um, so, anyways, okay. Well, the draft was fun. I think we'll uh, maybe maybe we'll do this again next year if we can uh, do it. Maybe we'll expand it or. Um, but I, so I want to I want to I want to shift gears a little bit, and I want to throw something out to you guys, um, and I'll and I'll tell you kind of what my thinking was on this, and, and at any point, just sort of stop me and tell me if it's crazy or if we want to keep going. So, um, so usually when I get these ideas, it's usually a, a couple of things kind of uh, connecting dots. So one of them is this um, kind of constant thing we're seeing where it's like you can't find enough people that, that know this sort of new cloud stuff, right? It's just a, a skill set that's still really new. The people who are good at it 
Um, it's few and far between. And so there's, there's sort of this overwhelming need to, to grow a set of people that, I don't know, no open stack, no cloud stack, no, um, how to really deal with things like chef and puppet, know how to you know design this stuff. And, you know, part of it, we came out of, we were talking to Randy bias a long time ago and Randy was like, yeah, we're building these blueprints, but it's hard for us to find people to do these things. And, you know, from, from talking to different companies. So I was kind of like, okay, there, there's gotta be, there's an opportunity there for somebody to, you know, become the train signal, the, you know, the, 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 the great trainer of, you know, people. And, and the second piece of it was I, I kept seeing all you guys who are, who are home lab people going, oh, I've got to buy new gear and I'm on the road and I'm, I can't get to my gear or my gear's down or I want to, you know, it, something screwed up and this, that, and the other. And I was like, we have all these sort of on-demand, we have all these on-demand environments these days, whether it's something from AWS or from Rackspace or from whoever. I'm like, how come we don't put the two of those things together, right? And, you know, I kind of, I kind of was basing it off of like what VMware does with hands-on labs or what, you know, I've been involved with with EMC with hands-on labs and blah, blah, blah. So my thinking went something like this. Um, we get somebody, one of the one of the cloud providers hosts this, and it could be Rackspace because they want to drive an OpenStack agenda. Fine, it could be you know Aaron. It could be one of the cloud stack providers. It could be somebody does this on AWS. It could be whatever. And the whole idea being, as a as an end user, as a person who has a lab, it could be you guys. It could be Jason Nash. It could be anybody. Um, you ought to be able to basically go and say at any point in time, you know, I want an environment and, you know, you can do this today on things like, like tri stack and, and dev stack, but, but they're just kind of like, you know, give me an environment, give me a sandbox. There's not really a structure for how you go about sort of learning it. Right. There's not the, there's not the sort of educational piece. There's just, you know, bits and figure it out. So my idea- like gamification or, or was it Coursera? Yeah, apply I mean, to 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 access to materials to learn. Well, them. I mean, I'll, I mean, I'll give you a perfect example. And Aaron and I kicked around this thing, um, like when he was talking about you know taking this this role over to OpenStack. It was like I need to get an environment up and running, and I need to learn this stuff fairly quickly. And yeah, I can play around with it, but you know, the amount of time sometimes it takes to just kind of get it up and running, or to kind of go, I want to learn these five or six basic things first. Like once I learn that stuff, then I can go play with some things. And, you know, and the thing Are you about there, it, Brian? You went away. Uh-oh. Am I still here? Okay, at least I'm, I'm not the only... I thought that my headset was dying. Okay. You guys hear me? Try it again. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, so anyway, so, you know, and as I was talking to some other people, they were like, um, you know, there's stuff to learn. Obviously, there's new things to learn, but they were like you know, I don't have the time to either set it up or I don't know how often I would use it. I'd love to just be able to sort of push a button and, and use it when I want to use it. If I'm going to spend a couple of hours playing around with it, uh, or, you know, here and there, and then, you know, turn it off. Right. So I kind of got to thinking and I, and I think this is possible. Um, and I think there's actually a, a way for somebody, if they spent some time building it to make money off it. So it would go something like this. Your user experience would be, uh, you log in, and you're going to get, you can, you basically are going to get uh, an on-demand environment that you can pick. You can pick an open stack environment, a cloud stack environment, a, you know, potentially a, a VMware environment. If they want to offer something like that, it could be anybody else's stuff. Um, eucalyptus. Yeah. Eucalyptus. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then from that, you can, you'll basically, there'd be a, there'd be a set of, um, there'd be a set of sort of almost like training modules or sort of like, yeah, like courseware kind of things that you could walk through and it would sort of give you step by step. If you're looking for some learning stuff, there's an opportunity there to build a marketplace for the companies like, uh, cloud ability and, um, cloud passage and all these guys that, uh, you know, offer these sort of add ons to this function. It could be right scale. It could be in stratus. It could be whatever. Um, so you could go, you could pick up some of their stuff and just figure out how it works in your environment. And the, I think where there's an opportunity to make money is a couple of different places. So um, obviously to start spinning up these environments would typically would cost you some money, it would cost you some sort of whatever uh, per hour or per gig or bandwidth cost or whatever. And you could either pay for it. Um, you could either pay for it sort of upfront, uh, pay some sort of fee, say, 
two fifty a year or whatever. We'd figure out exactly what it would cost. Plus, you may have some marginal cost if you're a real heavy user. Um, but there's an option there to where you say, okay, um, I could I could get the free version, and the free version includes every time I log on, I get a two minute, five minute video roll from one of the sponsor companies. You know, and just from all the companies that we've talked to, um, I think those guys would probably go, hey, we'll put up. You know, five hundred bucks, five thousand bucks, ten thousand dollars, whatever it is, in order to sort of have access to people that are trying to learn this stuff. So imagine if you're in Stratus, who people aren't sure who they are, they're not sure what to do with them. Um, every time one of these, you know, guys who is a the expert who's trying to learn this stuff, who's a sysadmin who's trying to learn this stuff, they get a five minute roll, they get a two minute roll of something that goes, Hey, this is, this is who we are. This is where we're going to fit into your learning environment. And this is why we might be great. Once you go, once you go live with this thing. Or even um, past that, frankly, you know, I'd look, I'd use that for recruiting. Well, you could use if someone's for... out there self learning after hours, expanding their knowledge. Right. You know, that's yeah, so, especially if it's almost like a code year or code Academy where people can create their own courseware. Right. Well, Heck, that was, this so is the people I bring in for interviews. I'm part right. of my company. Right. So that's the, so that's sort of the next piece of it. So, um, so as a user, you can go on, you'd have different, you know, levels of, uh, levels of learning that you could do levels of payment structure that you would potentially have. Um, you know, you work on it for a couple of hours, you go, great. I don't want to keep paying the per hour thing. You, we, we put a, you know, real simple save button. It does a snapshot, basically saves off your environment. Um, you come back to it when you want to come back to it. And then from a, from a, you know, from a company perspective. So let's say you're um, somebody who, who offers a cloud service or you offer a cool cloud add on or something. You now have a, a marketplace where you can, you can build some modules that you want to do that people can either buy, or you can, you know, you can uh, again, put them into the free version, put them into the, you know, people can pay for them version. Um, you can have people, you know, you build it from a community perspective. If you get 10, 10 steps into the OpenStack one, you can, you can, uh, you know, kind of be ranked as, as higher up. You're a ninja for that. You can be available to help other people online as they go through some of these things. Um, but I, I think over, I, I keep coming back to this thing. Like I think there is the technology exists today. And I, I think there's the demand if you could get it kind of whenever you wanted to, to have, you know, the equivalent of home lab, but home lab for a lot of these new things that we all know are going to be coming down the pike somewhere. Um, but just the sort of, I'm not exactly sure how to get up and running with it. I'm not exactly sure what tools to go with what, or I'm not sure where to go with it. Um, I think there's a market for people to, to consume it and to, to put things into the community or into the marketplace and, and either make money or recruit or use it as a marketing vehicle, whatever it might be. Um, and I feel like it's kind of this untapped space. So I'll stop well, yes, talking. I'll stop talking and see if you guys. It's have any funny you bring on. that up, right? So, I mean, personally, I think uh, open access to knowledge and open sharing of knowledge is something that really, you know, is one of the great things about the internet, and, and frankly, dri- has driven Silicon Valley um, further than anywhere in the world, right? Because nerds yep. getting together and sharing what they know. Um, I, I I love you. Know, I'd love to understand how Code Academy makes money, mm-hmm. right? Um, obviously they're lightweight on resources, but it's user contributed. You know, I love, if you look what like, um, uh, Josh does with V Brown bags and Josh and Cody and all them, um, that type of user generated content. Um, I I think that there's, there's ways to monetize it. And I know for sure that there have been discussions, uh, um, a friend of mine, um, has actually has a couple thousand servers that's coming through his lab each is rotating through his infrastructure. And part of that, and one of that discussion has been like, oh, well, how can we you know, expand things like TriStack um, into things very similar to this, not, but not with the, 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 the measured learning structures or the uh, kind of learning maps and that kind of stuff. It's, it's an interesting take. Yeah. So. yeah. And it really, in my mind, too, it's, it, you know, we've all talked about home labs or, you know, Colin and I, like the lab we had back at E Plus once upon a time, um, <laughs> that it, it the biggest problem with with home labs or, or like you know a, a lot of vendor labs is the gear gets old quick, um, yeah. and they're you know decently expensive to maintain if you're doing it after hours on your budget. Um, and and yeah, the whole the whole idea of just turning that into an opex versus a capex, um, but for you know you personally for your education and your career development, I, I think that's an incredible idea. Yeah. Well, I was kind of before the podcast. I was kind of sketching out where my lab's been over the years, right? So, 
started with the most powerful server in Fresno, right? And that was, I think, $3,000 or $4,000. That was in the mid-'90s. Then it became 15 routers from Cisco, including a Mao, some token ring. Then it was a crate full of IP phones. It was voice gateways. It was all really about it's about four to five thousand dollars every three years, right? And then it had voice gateways, UC five hundred, my will C's, APs. Then it can then it started collapsing down into software. You know, it had one server that could was doing the CCD stuff. Um, Forty routers were virtually running on top of Z, on GNS three. And then you know it's evolved to where it is now on the storage stuff. You know, at our last employer, I had uh, what uh, four seventy eight teams. You know, a couple million dollars worth of stuff in, in the in the Silicon Valley lab. Um, we're doing some big you know big internet stuff, but uh, now it's down to I think three or four um, shuttle PCs, Core i sevens with thirty two gigs of RAM and uh, twenty four terabytes SAN, and it's rather cheap. I mean, it's four thousand dollars, and everything's in software there. Yep. And, and a lot of the complexity, and, and frankly, there's a lot of places that have a lot cheaper access to technology. One of the challenges I've been thinking of is, like, how do I give access to my lab and still, frankly, I don't want to build the framework to be to delegate access and control people and make it so they don't run do stupid stuff with my bandwidth. Um, right. Maybe that's the whole side of it, too. How do those of us that have access to equipment, either, you know, I've got a multi-million dollar lab at my current work that my engineers use, how do maybe we make portion of that publicly available and um, use that as almost a sponsorship? Well, and that's the thing. I mean, you you know, you watch, um, you know, just just as an example, like you know, we, we sat and watched. Aaron was out at the AWS event. I was sitting there watching the keynote, and you watch some of the announcements that come out. I mean, um, you know, so you were talking about a whole bunch of Cisco gear, which obviously is you know expensive stuff from from a procurement perspective. It's also you know has a physical aspect to it. But I mean, more and more. You know, Citrix's some of Citrix's network gear, some of Cisco's network gear, uh, other vendors type of you know stuff that would traditionally you'd think of as being a, a big piece of hardware is now a VSA or it's a you know it's a it's a virtual appliance or it's some sort of software form factor. Um, I think there's an opportunity, and yeah, if if you know if if you were Cisco or something and you said, look, like I uh, you know we just moved our Nexus 1000V to a software you know free version platform like. This would be a great way for them to do it, and they don't have to necessarily run the infrastructure to maintain it. They just set up some modules for it, and uh, you know, same thing for Citrix. You could set up, you know, somebody could build an entire module on how do you do, you know, virtual private um, gateways, virtual private clouds between a couple of set of net scalers, or between, uh, you know, how do I how do I set up VXLAN between you know a couple of uh, Nexus 1000 Vs or something along those lines? I, yeah, I mean, I think I think that would be the trick. Is I think you could get a bunch of vendor sponsors um, to put some money forth. And uh, I kind of wish Nick was on the show because him and I had kicked around the idea of what would what would the automation behind this be needed. Um, and I don't know that it would be all that different than like what they do at, at like VMworld where it's like, you know, show up, you get a, you get an environment and, you know, there's, you know, certain things that they suggest that you do, but you can kind of play with it and do what you want. And, um, you know, and like you guys said, I mean, if, if folks are in for two, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 each, you know, if you were to say, Hey, look, instead of that, that's going to be two or 300 bucks, or there's a possibility that you could, you know, be part of a bigger community. Uh, you know, you may, you may be able to attract a bunch of users that way. So it'd be, it'd be an interesting thing. I, I think, um, you know, I think about stuff like, uh, you know, talking to guys like Scott Sanchez over at, at, uh, at, at Rackspace about the, the on-premise, you know, enterprise OpenStack stuff that he's doing. And it's like, you're going to have to figure out, you're going to have to find some people that know how to run OpenStack and you're going to have to find people that know how to run CloudStack. And, you know, if you can if you can give them an environment to go learn that stuff, and like you said, Colin, one guy's not going to blow up the next guy's environment, and you don't have to worry about you know mucking around with VPNs and firewalls. Uh, might be worth something to somebody. Yeah, and you, if you think about it, you know, the, we, we learn the most when we're actually trying to accomplish something useful. Yeah. Um, to pull it pull that together would uh, really require you know multi uh, a multi cloud uh, a multiple cloud federation. Um, as well as nested environments, as well as an automation framework and service catalogs, yeah. um, that would be an interesting, interesting thing. And, and yeah, I just thinking of you know, just my, just the Pleasance and Lab alone over a Nexus um, could explode, ex- expose uh, a couple of the OpenStack instances externally. 
Yeah. You know, we're set up in a way where you know it could basically nest that where it wouldn't be too much of a, too much of a hassle. You know, it's only mainly used during the day, but to be yeah. able to effectively call into wherever the wherever the portal is and say, okay, there's an available slot for utilizing this, and be able to pop up a you know Nexus advertising or you know apply for one of our 72 jobs, right? Yeah, or 72 open jobs right now. Um, you know, that alone would be worth exposing. You know. For you know, for all intents and purposes, resources that are already paid for. Right. Yeah, I know. At one point, Nick and I had kicked around the idea when uh, uh, Adrian from from Netflix they they open sourced basically kind of their provisioning tool. Now it was you know AWS specific, but it was like, hmm, I forget what the name of it was. Oh, it's Asgard. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 He was, he was, pretty awesome. When that thing it, when that thing cloud got formations a, and, and NIST access controls. Yeah. When that thing got open sourced, it was like that was another one of those sort of light bulb moments. I was like, I wonder if we could use that as sort of the framework. And yeah, you're right. I mean, over time, it probably would need to be a multi-cloud type of thing. But even if it just got started on one cloud, um, I mean, I think there's enough vendors, at least now, that are starting to make some of their stuff available. Um, and, you know, you're not running it in production. So, I mean, you could get it running uh, on one cloud and another cloud. And, um, you know, I mean, the Cloud Foundry guys probably are going to be looking for folks who, you know, I mean, that's a small that's a small crowd of people. Um, so anyways, that's my, that's my rant for the evening. Um, hopefully maybe somebody who, who listens to the show who has, uh, more coding skills or more automation skills or, you know, finds it somewhat interesting. will give us some feedback. We'd love to hear it from people. Um, and if you tell us, you know, it sucks and you're, you know, you, you don't touch my $3,000 lab, <laughs> that's fine too. Um, uh, I know people like their own toys as well. So, um, anyways, well, listen, um, couple of things before we sign off for the year, I guess, because uh, I think this will probably end up being it either because of the Mayans or because of uh, holidays and everything for everybody. Um, Aaron, you want to give a shout out to all the nice folks who've been uh, really, really generous to us on this Krispy Kreme challenge? Yeah. So, I mean, we're at, gosh, as of today, it's like, what, 61% or thereabouts um, yeah. of our funding goal. So, I mean, the, the response has just been absolutely amazing so far. So, so thank you, everyone. Um, apparently, a lot of people, uh, you know, w- want to watch us go eat donuts and be sick, but that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll take the money. It's going to a great cause. Yep. Um, and, and just a reminder to everyone, uh, we are matching um, the first th- up to the first thousand dollars. And um, as of right now, um, uh, what as of oh I guess maybe earlier this week actually we are in first place of anyone raising money for the the race so uh, really cool little distinction for right now I don't know that we'll be able to maintain that but it's cool to say we're number one for right now um, so again the money goes to North Carolina Children's Hospital and and a huge thank you to everyone that's donated so far yeah absolutely so um, before we wrap up um, Colin anything to plug or anything cool you're working on that uh, folks should know about. Um, actually, uh, nothing really cool to plug. Uh, I am uh, moving uh, positions in my company, though, doing something incredibly interesting and relevant um, to the Cloudcast. So, um, Very cool. Yeah, yeah. So I, I kind of grew the line of business I came into 18 months ago by 300%. Nice. So not, not so bad. Um, it's a almost $100 million line of business today. Nice. Um, and so uh, moving on, I'll be moving into a, a chief strategy role. Um, on top of all of our technology verticals and uh, launching a cloud line of business. Very nice. So um, focused and, on um, OpenStack, open source, um, as well as uh, kind of helping people on their uh, full transition to uh, cloud consumption, whether it be public hey, or private. Do you have lots of job openings right now? Yep. We have 72 open RICs out of 500, and uh, we've grown 100, uh, 115 associates this year, so we're 535 people. So cool. growing strong, growing, so very nice. growing strong so, in there for the long haul. So, so, so if you got cloud, company. if you got cloud skills, uh, hook up with Colin. Uh, and you, yeah. you guys, you guys are all over the country, right? What's that? You guys are all over the country, right? Or at least yeah, uh, in, in all the big offices. Fifteen offices uh, across the United States, I believe, and that's uh, Nexus IS. Cool. So I had Carter on the West Coast, but we're everywhere. So. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, well, listen, uh, why don't we wrap it up? Um, Aaron, you want to uh, take us home? Yeah, sure. So if you like the show, please tell us a friend or leave us a review on iTunes. You can follow us on Twitter at thecloudcastnet or on the web at thecloudcast.net where you can find links to everything Cloudcast. Thanks for listening, everyone. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy Holidays. And we'll talk to you in 2013 as long as the Mayans don't get us.